Welcome to the Sports Medicine Orthopod, a show about the world of sports medicine and the people who inhabit it. My name is Anthony Yu. Folks, we got a rock star in the house. You may recognize him from his many appearances on networks such as CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, or you may have caught him in the Funny You Should Mask special where he's interviewed by none other than my hero, doctor turned actor Ken Jeong. He is an expert in the fields of infectious disease and epidemiology, chief medical officer at Osmosis, a beacon of truth in a sea of misinformation, an old friend of mine from UCLA, and just a good, good dude, Dr. Rishi Desai. Rishi, welcome to the show. It's so great to see you. Wow, that is that is quite the intro, Anthony. I <laughs> that's that that sets me up for nothing but just you know coming downhill the rest of the show. So that, should we that just end it? Should you. we just end the show? I feel <laughs> like that's about as high as I'm going to get. So that's awesome. <laughs> that's good. Uh, Rishi. We've known each other for a long time. I, I, I know your background, but it's it's very interesting story. You have what we could put it mildly as an accelerated educational pathway. You started UCLA where we were at together for undergrad at age 14, medical school at age 18. Tell us about that. What was that pathway like? So, and, and I don't know if you know all this, but I actually was not born in the US. I was born in London. And so my parents brought me over. I was an only only child the US and my dad's mentality was, you know, why would you spend an extra year in school if you can spend that same year working? That's like twice the money, right? Like the money you <laughs> earn working minus like not having all that debt, right? So he's like, well, of course you would skip a grade if you can. And so we like early on, I skipped first grade, which if you think about it, like what do you learn in first grade? A lot of the stuff you learn, you could probably learn from your parents if they're super motivated to teach you that stuff. So my dad was, so we immediately, you know, from the get go, we did all the things that, you know, essentially second graders do at home. So he talked to my teachers, got me into second grade after kindergarten. And then it was kind of normal. I just, you know, third grade, fourth grade. And then around sixth grade, he almost like an itch, you know, you had to scratch it again. And so he's like, I feel like you should do it again. And so I was like, all right, and at that age, it's like, I'm a little kid. I just do what my parents tell me, right? And, Absolutely. Um, and my parents were, I think, a little bit more, you know, um, controlling than most in the sense that, like, I never had sleepovers. I never had play dates. And so I also had no points of reference, right? So the only things that I know are, like, what, you know, my my authoritarian parents tell me. Sure. And so they told me this is normal. You skip grades, this normal. And so we skipped seventh grade. So... Then I go into eighth grade. Again, like this is just my my worldview. I think this is normal. Ninth grade hits, and then my parents say, my dad says, like, you know, I think you should do it a third time. And at this point, I'm sort of like seeing like what's out there in the outside world. I'm like, ah, I don't think everyone does this. This is a little weird. And so I put up quite a resistance. I didn't want to do it. I was like, ah, I don't want to do it. And my dad's like, oh, just try it, just try it. But it's not the kind of thing you just try. It's not like a pair of pants. You're like, oh, they didn't fit. I'll, I'll go yeah, back yeah. To it. Yeah. So it's like, well, once you do it, you're done. So I skipped tenth grade went from 9th to 11th, then 12th, and I was 14, like you just said, and went right into college. And in a way, like now that I'm older, I'm like, yeah, maybe it was actually just fine for me at that time. Um, because at the time I was 14, I was kind of like butting heads with my parents, just starting to, right? Yeah. And that's also the moment where I got shipped off to UCLA. Yeah. And so I was living in the dorms at the time when a lot of 14-year-olds were having angst and like, you know, real drama with their parents. So I never really had that. And so actually my parents' relationship with me was great. Like yeah. honestly, it was, it was amazing. Like I saw them every weekend at, when I was at UCLA. We had just enough time to like really love each other. And then by the time that I would get irritated with them because I was moody, I was gone. I was back, you know, in the dorm. So that was my, sure. that was my upbringing. And the regular 18 year olds were not going to put up with your teenage angst. They're just like, no, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. It's like, all right, if you're going to be all weird, then go eat by yourself. And I'm like, oh, well, I don't want that. So, yeah. <laughs> so I think yeah. that kept me in check. And I had really good friends. You know, I, I feel like I got super lucky, you know, just like a roll of the dice that went my way. It could have gone the other way. And so I ended up having really good friends in college, um, friends you know, like Christian, Darlene, Jenny. And I think that I owe a lot of my confidence to that group because they kind of took me under their wing and they kind of normalized things Sure. Um, for me at a time that I could have easily been with another group of friends that made things super wacky. So yeah. I, I feel like I lucked out. Yeah, and I mean, for those who don't know you, it, it wasn't super apparent. You were just kind of like a regular goofy kid like we all were and like to 
hang out and play video games and dance and talk to girls and it was just totally normal. It wasn't that apparent. Now, if this was me, like I would just walk into the classroom and be like, "Do you know how young I am? Do you know how young I am?" But like you were just totally cool. You just like did not did not even notice it. Um, I, it's funny. I'm picturing your dad as like Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec. Like he, you're like in third grade, and he's like, "All right, you got to get to the steel mill for your shift." Uh, you know, <laughs> you can't get a snack at three p.m. You, you got you got you got to get working. <laughs> it's it's funny. My, my dad, he's such an interesting dude. Like, and my mom too. But like, my dad is the driver behind this part of it, and he's like the most loving guy, like loving parent. And for his generation of Indians, like that's just unusual. Like he would play with me, wrestle with me. Like he was super involved as a dad. And then, and I think it was because we had such a strong bond. I, I trusted him completely. Yeah. And so then when he said like, this is what we're going to do, even if it felt like weird or hard at school, like I just knew I could talk to him and he was sure. you know, my best friend growing up. And so I think that that was what, what made it happen, made it work, you know, honestly. What was it challenging for like friendships? You know, you're in, uh, you know, whatever ninth grade, you spend the year becoming best friends with Tommy, and then next year you're in eleventh grade, and he's in tenth grade with the rest of the morons and idiots. Like, w- was that kind of weird for for some of these friendships you made during those schooling years? It it was, yeah. And you know, the honest truth is, I had a couple of friends that were really you know good friends that we would eat every day with, you know, lunch every day with. Uh, but I, you know, as I mentioned, I never did play dates. I never did sleep over n- none of that stuff. And so I was kind of not involved in in the social group to be honest you know nowadays you've got tons of ways to be involved without being involved in person as as we all know but back then it was like if you're not there in person how would you know what's happening sure and so i just wasn't involved at all so much so that my life and my identity as a a high school kid was really just about school right like i just and i kind of took all of that you know competitive juice inside of me and just said look i'm just gonna I may not, I may have like one friend, but I'm going to crush it in English and crush yeah. it in like, <laughs> you know, history. And, you know, right. that's what I'm going to put all my energy on. Yeah. And I, and that's going to be me. And then I got to college and then a weird thing happened where I was like, oh my gosh, I, I have friends and I'm hanging out with them and I'm getting, you know, for the first time in my life, I'm getting beats. Like, and that, that may seem weird to folks I'm like, oh, it's a B, what's a big deal. And that's how I see it now. But at the time, it was it was a big deal. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is really weird. I'm having this sort of like crisis of identity. I'm not like crushing it in school. Yeah. And but but I have friends for the first time. So that, that part's amazing. Right. And and then I think I just got so, so into this other culture of like video games, basically. Yeah. yeah. And I was just like at the time, Warcraft 2 came out and Starcraft wow. would come out soon later. And, and so I just got in, so into that and friendships. Yeah. That I was like, okay, maybe maybe it's fine to not get A's in school. And so for the first time, I wasn't so extreme in my identity around school. And I think that was good. You know, I, I honestly think that balanced me out a little bit as, as just a human being. And so, and, and I think UCLA is also just, for what it's worth, it was, it was a great institution for me. So I just had a lot of growth that happened, you know, while I was there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, how much money would you estimate you would have if you had a nickel for every time somebody compared you to Doogie Howser? <laughs> well, I'm, think, I'm thinking like sixty-seven dollars, which actually a ton of nickels. That's yeah, like right, a exactly. Nickels, right? That's a lot of nickels. That's yeah, right. probably, and probably like if it was a nickel jar, it would have filled up a long time ago. Because yeah. the funny thing is that like a long time ago, this was like the thing, right? Like I was fourteen yeah. in high school, and then I applied to med, med school, and Doogie Howser was a show back then. Like today, yeah, yeah. You know, like a lot of people, kids right. like. What, what is that? So I, at the time, it was it was the quintessential like thing to compare me to, and it came up a lot. And then as years have gone on, Anthony, it's so funny because now, like, how often do people talk about age? Not not a lot, right? And then like, how often do people like put it together and yeah. say like, wait a second, if you finish that at that time, that must mean that like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So like, literally nobody nowadays knows. Yeah. yeah. Nobody knows unless like Anthony you know, invites me for an interview, like it never comes up. Right. <laughs> so I, I don't think a lot of my friends nowadays know, uh, if it comes up, like it's because I've known them for like three years and it just yeah. comes up. Right. And then they're like, wait, what, what, what? Tell me, tell me about that. And so it's now it's kind of this like weird little story, just like mm-hmm. a coll- like we all have like collections of weird little stories sure. of, like this sure. and that that you bumped into back in, back when yeah. it's for me, it's like one of my li- weird little stories. Yeah, um, yeah. So it doesn't come up a lot now, but 
that nickel jar filled up a lot of, yeah. like, in a big way <laughs> for many, many years. Yeah. Were, were you thinking a career in medicine this entire time, like throughout the educational process? You know, it's funny. Like if I had to be honest, I, I would say my, my most passionate moments are when I'm studying math or physics. <laughs> I love math. I love engineering. I love physics. And it's a big regret of mine that I didn't do that in college, that I didn't yeah. pursue that. Instead, I pursued uh, what I thought would get me into medical school. And a lot of that, I think, comes back to, at the age of 14, asking people this question that I think is maybe a slightly dangerous question. And, and I try not to ask this of, of my own son, which is, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it, and it implies like there's this end point that you got, like, what do you want to be? There's going to be one thing. What is it? Name it. And I think people get locked in. Un yeah. honestly and like I got locked in yeah. and so that was my big thing I got locked into thinking I'm going to do medicine and so let me like reverse engineer how to get there so that means I major sure. in this means that I that I have this identity and so I think that would be the the one thing I would change if I'd go back but um but yeah I, I think that's just the the question I try to steer away from because nowadays it's like I do this and then you know we'll get into it but like now then i went to public health and then i got into teaching and like right, right. my career is like meandering like a river right like look at look at you like you know you were you were you know doing acting then you went to orthopedics and now you're running a podcast now it's yeah. on video yeah. you know it's like it's meandering and it's it's beautiful that way yeah. and i think that when you see it as like an organic thing that grows it's awesome yeah. but when you see it as like this thing that you're trying to achieve it can become stressful yeah. And so I think for a long time it was this stressful thing and I, and I just kind of named what I wanted to be um, and probably wasn't the, the healthiest way of doing it. I wouldn't beat yourself up. I mean, at 14, I was just trying to like beat Sonic the Hedgehog without losing too many lives. So uh, you had bigger fish to fry, bigger decisions <laughs> to make at a very young age. That's um, true. So from UCLA, you went to UCSF, which those who are not in the medical field, UCSF is the cream of the cream. That's one of the best centers. It, in general for anything medicine related. Um, so you went there for medical school and then Boston Children's for pediatric residency and then pediatric infectious disease fellowship at USC. I'm always interested, kind of pick the brains of doctors to kind of hear how that pathway went. What what was your interest in those fields? How, how did you eventually settle on PEDS ID? Yeah, so the key word is subtle. And yeah. so I, <laughs> this is how I did it, right? That's a great word for it. Because when I was at UCLA, I was like, let me just apply, right? Like everyone, I just want to get into med school. I don't care where I go. Just hope yeah. someone accepts me. Same party line. And then I got into UCSF. I was so excited. It's a big city. It's a new city. Yeah. You know, I'm 18. I want to go explore Northern California. I've never seen that, that, that area before. And I had these friends. Um, from Northern California, including yeah. yourself, yeah, that that made me really intrigued by it, and so I was stoked. I got there, I was so happy, and after med school, I had to decide on a residency, and so I chose pediatrics for myself. At the time, it was mostly about okay, what do I not want to do, and so I didn't want to do procedures. I just felt like, look, uh, to me, it felt like a glorified mechanic, and so I was like, <laughs> I don't want to do that. Not Easy now. School. I know, I know. I know your audience. I know. I know. I get it. But I'm being honest because your audience is also very, they're going to they're gonna like the authenticity of this. That's so right. I was like, I don't want to do that. That's just not me. And then also, I'm not good at it. Like, that's just the honest truth. I'm not good at it. And I never, so when I was doing my surgery rotation, for example, people were like clamoring for like, oh, I want OR time. I was like, take mine. I'll, yeah. say, I'm, I'll say I'm busy on the wards. You know? like, so, I'm good. I, yeah, totally. And so I was always ducking out of the OR to do other stuff. And, and that was fine by me. Right? I was like, I don't, I don't see myself going into it. And then the other thing is, honestly, like, I just feel like when I'm with kids, I my energy level goes boop, 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 going up. And when I'm with adults, I'm like, boop, 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 going down. Because when I'm with adults, I'm like, man, get get your act together. You're an adult, you know? Like, yeah. Why are you yeah. eating garbage? And Why are yeah. you not working out? And why are you not stretching and I, like all this like health and wellness stuff that you're not doing, which is why we're here right now, right? Um, and with kids, I'm like, dude, you're amazing. You tell the truth, you're honest, you're straightforward. Like all these things that, that we all, that I, I'm not gonna assume, that I love about kids and I can be with them all day. It was so, so cool. It was just invigorating for me. So it, it made it kind of an obvious choice. And then, 
And then what you realize is that it's like 10% kids, 90% parents. Yeah. And so it's a lot of like parent management. <laughs> and so um, I came into that and I was like, okay, I get it. And so when I was doing residency, I understood and I got better and better at like parent management. But I thought, I don't want to do this my whole life. I want to do something that is a little bit more focused on the problem mm -hmm. um, rather than like anticipatory guidance. And so I essentially gravitated towards ID because I was like, what specialty does zero procedures? Yeah. <laughs> right? Not too many, but like IDs on the list. Yeah. And I was like, all right, that's cool. And I thought maybe I'll do something international. You know, I've also loved traveling. I was like, maybe I could take this internationally. So that was kind of the, the whimsical sort of approach. So I went to do ID fellowship and I loved it. It was really, really great experience. I did it at CHLA, which is an awesome institution in Southern California. Mm -hmm. And my mentors there were like pff, amazing clinicians. It's a great hospital. And then I thought, okay, now it's time to be a grown up and get a job. Yeah. And that's when I had a big rude awakening because I've always, up until then, I'd been so coddled because I was like, oh, if, I'll go to a school, I'll go to this university, I'll go here. And I always thought, okay, I'm a good kid. I went to good <laughs> schools. Surely I can get a good job. Like, that's just like what I grew up with. Like, that's the, that's the Kool-Aid I always drank. Yeah. And I believed that that's just how it works. And then I went and looked at the job market. I was like, wait, what? I have to do research? Yeah. Like, and then I have like, what, what's hard money and soft money? What is all this? Like, I don't understand. Right. I just want to get a good paying job in California because that's where my family's at. So when I came to realize that research was part of the equation, I was always like, oh, I'm checked out. I don't want to do that because yeah. that's not what I like. So then I'm like in scramble mode because I'm like, oh my God, I spent 10 years in medicine. How did I not realize that like, yeah. if I would end up here? Almost like painting yourself into a corner. Right. And you're like, wait, I'm too far from the door. How, how do I get out without like ruining the paint that I just laid down? Yeah. So I was like, I'll take this leap of faith into public health. And so I went and got my MPH. I went to the CDC and yeah. started doing... Um, outbreak investigations. And yeah. that was a great, great um, decision for me. Yeah. So that was my next uh, kind of uh, bullet point on the timeline is you went back to UCLA to get that MPH, Master of Public Health in Epidemiology. You, you like that uh, Kanye West song from the college dropout. You like can keep yourself warm with all your degrees. <laughs> um, what, what is epidemiology? What, what is that? Yeah, it's a good question. So epidemiology is sort of the study of how, I'll say diseases, because that's the easiest thing to kind of make tangible, like how diseases affect populations. Mm. But it doesn't just have to be diseases. You know, epidemiology could be the study of any sort of risk, right? Like, so for example, we're in Cal, I'm in California, in Oakland, we often now talk about, you know, fires and yeah. smoke, yeah. right? So how does smoke affect populations? And you find out, oh my gosh, it affects you know, younger people may be much worse than older people. And then you're like, wait a second, but COVID-19, that's the opposite. COVID-19 affects older people worse than younger people. So it's sort of like, how do these things that are in our environment, how do they affect our population? Right. And, and how does it vary depending on maybe age or gender or, you know, economics? You know, those are often the big three, but there are many, many other factors. And so that study and anything you can learn from that, that might affect things like policy, or it might affect like who gets vaccine first. That's all kind of in the domain of epidemiology. Nowadays, people can relate because they're like, oh, I heard that if you're over a certain age, you can get the vaccine first. Right. Yeah, that's epidemiology in action. Yeah, okay. like, that's gotcha. literally because of epidemiology that we have made this prioritization for this kind of crucial resource called the vaccine uh, and society kind of follows those rules. And so you went to the CDC, as you mentioned, next, and your title there was Epidemic Intelligent Officer, Intelligence Officer. You did that for two years. What, what were you doing there? What kind of work? So it's really interesting. You go there and you have a two-year timeline. So you know in 24 months, I'm going to either get a job here or I'm going to move on. Like you, and uh -huh. so it's kind of a nice thing to know because you're not always like, oh, you know, am I going to get fired tomorrow or you know, how long is this going to go? It's, it's defined. Yeah. And during that two years, your job description, among many things, is to essentially get sent off. You fly off on an airplane, you fly to a city, could be international, could be domestic, wherever, where there might be an outbreak happening. And, and your job is to figure out what is going on. Yeah. And so, for example, you know, I was asked to investigate 
Uh, and and the, the background on this is, is kind of interesting, but basically there was an outbreak of diarrhea among NBA basketball players. Oh. And so one of the outbreaks I was asked to investigate was this NBA norovirus outbreak. It turned out to be norovirus, which is a, a virus that causes nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea yeah. among NBA basketball players. And to see if there's anything we can do to stop it, to maybe lay down recommendations to prevent the next outbreak. And, and so that was my job. And so I got to investigate that outbreak. That was definitely the, the sexiest of the outbreak <laughs> investigations. Usually you're going to nursing homes or other places that are, are not as interesting or newsworthy perhaps, but, um, but that was the, the one that I enjoyed the most. NBA diarrhea was just the, yeah, man. that was yeah, the cream and, of the cream. <laughs> not, yeah, yeah. The cream is like a generous way of describing what I did, but yeah, it's not cream, but, um, but yes, yeah, so, I mean, I was literally on, on a call and I, I'm not going to say his name, but like with an NBA basketball player who's well known and was like, Hey, this is how you collect stool and put it in the cup and, you know, seal it and put your name on it. And, and send it off. We'll take care of it. So it was. It was kind of an interesting thing, and you know, yeah. you get kind of interesting insights from doing that. If only that was the MLB, then you could have just ran with. If you're sliding into first, <laughs> right, you know, all day long, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, listening to your experience, like you seem like the man to get us and shepherd us through this pandemic we all lived through. I mean, you're literally like Dustin Hoffman from Outbreak, like. One day they're going to make it a movie because that's just what they're going to do about COVID-19. And hopefully it's not, you know, for, I don't want to see it for about 50 years, but, uh, you know, it's going to open with like a pangolin or some sort of wild animal at yeah, the, yeah. Uh, some like random Wuhan street market. And then the next scene's literally going to be cutting to you, like eating pizza at Zachary's or something. Yeah. Uh, so that's, like, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's kind of, it's no joke. I mean, like a lot of the folks that were on the ground and doing investigative work were EIS officers. Cause I mean, that's literally what you sign up for. Like yeah. those two years you're off flying around the world and it's amazing experience, right? Cause you're yeah. dealing with like, like you mentioned, you know, the, the fact that this outbreak started in China. And so you're, you're dealing with the WHO and Chinese health officials. And then you're, and then you're moving maybe to other countries that are now affected and you're like, Oh, right. what's going on in South Korea. And then, and then what's happening in the U S and so you're working with all these like agencies and, and as a young person coming out of residency and fellowship, it just opened my eyes to the fact like, like, oh, this is how the world works. You know what I mean? It was, it was another kind of growth, growth period, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so COVID-19 didn't come right away. It, it was a decade after this experience, roughly. Uh, and during that time, you're not just like hunkering down, waiting for something terrible to happen. You know, you, you go back to the Bay Area, we start practicing, you, you get married, have a son, you have family, you got practice. Uh, you, you join Osmosis, this uh, tech company that's focused on uh, medical education delivered uh, virtually or online. And life is beautiful and things great. And then, you know, year and a half ago, uh, all hell breaks loose. What, what were you thinking in these early days as everything was unfolding? You know, it's, it's, um, it, it's a really good question. So I guess it almost felt like imagine being at a beach where everyone is just kind of hanging out. Mm. And you're the first one to look up and you see like a tidal wave and you're like, oh my God, there's a tsunami coming yeah. and everyone around me is just chilling. Yeah. And you already know, like, we're going to be running soon. Yeah. Some of these people can run faster than me and yeah. some can run slower than me, yeah. but I'm going to start right now running, right. Right. <laughs> you know, right. yeah. and that's basically the feeling. Like when I first learned about it, you know, back in, you know, late January, early February, sure. um, you know, I was talking to my wife, I was like, this is going to be massive. This is going to be a massive problem yeah. because this has all the, I mean, and information was kind of leaking in, so you didn't yeah. really fully get the sense of it, but sure. like it's a respiratory virus that goes person to person. At least we believe it goes person to person. Yeah. Um, and that's going to be a big, big problem for, for the world. Yeah. And so that was the, the first kind of feeling around it. And then it was just a matter of like, watching as this like water just approaches and more and more people start realizing it like, Oh my God, panic is setting in. Sure. And then your phone starts ringing and it's hello, CNN. Can you come on the national news tonight and, and give an opinion? Like what was that like to be thrust into this spotlight? Yeah. So that, that's a good question. And I think what happened is that essentially the CDC is 
at the forefront of this, right? Like mm -hmm. they're, they're public health entity. When things are going right, no one thinks about the CDC. When things are going wrong, like all eyes are on the CDC. And having worked there and because I was part of the division of viral diseases, which is, you know, what this is, um, people started reaching out and, and saying, hey, would you be willing to come on the program tonight to talk about this? And like you said, you know, CNN, um, I, I, the very first one was I got a call um, from the chief of staff of Bernie Sanders. Oh. And they said, hey, would you be willing to talk to Bernie? Um, it's in, you know, four hours. Yeah. And I'm like, what? Like, my first instinct is this is a prank. Like, there's no way, like, that yeah. this is real. And so I was like, sure, I'm happy to do it. And and so I did it. And it was the first big one, I would say. There were a few little, like, smaller outlets before that. But so I had some context around this. But talking to Bernie Sanders, I was like, you're, you're a national, you know, figure. Right. And you're talking to me. Yeah about this massive thing um that's it's it was just a very kind of awe-inspiring moment for me personally and then as time went on like you said cnn and others like reached out and then i kind of got more comfortable with it and understood sort of what they needed i got a better sense of like what they were looking for what they needed sure. and what they ultimately need is someone that has credibility uh -huh. and can come across and say like okay he's a doctor he worked at the CDC, so he's like checking boxes almost, right? Yeah. Um, and then, and then finally, the, maybe the last box is like, and does he articulate the problem? Well? Like, <laughs> because the truth is, like that last one, they can edit and they can work wonders with editing and like sure. edit me down to like that one little sentence that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so I think like it was truly that they needed my pedigree, not me. You know, mm -hmm. I, I kind of say jokingly, like any any warm blooded person in my position would have been called, honestly. Yeah. Um, it just happened that I got called because of that. And so it was awesome. It was just such an amazing experience for me personally. And I loved it. Like the, and you know, and all of them like top to bottom were just the most wonderful people to work with. So it was really, really, it was a good experience. Yeah. And, you know, they may have just looked at you as somebody that checked the boxes, but um, they opened themselves up to, your expertise and your personality, and this is no better exemplified than on April 2nd uh, of last year when you were on, uh, now infamously, Martha McCallum on Fox News, a clip that has gone viral, not really by any intention of your own, but just kind of the what, what happened. And so for the audience, please watch this clip because uh, if nothing else, it's really funny. But uh, Ms. McCallum is asking you um, about your stance on mass testing. And her sources are telling her that in spite of your uh, recommendation for mass testing at this point in the pandemic, there's millions of tests that are just laying around and not being used. And what's the deal? And then she goes on for a bit more. And meanwhile, you're just doing this. It's like I've asked my daughter to eat a vegetable. And it's just this literally for like 30 seconds. And then eventually she stops. And then you just stop, start dropping truth bombs. It's like you're like Steph Curry, just making it rain. Um, and it's just like one after another, it's just truth bomb, truth bomb, truth bomb. And then there's like five to 10 seconds of just awkward silence. And they're like, well, um, thanks for coming, Dr. Desai. We'll, we'll see ya. And uh, this went viral because it was like Rishi Desai just ended Fox News. He just, you know, he shat all over them. Uh, but then, there was actually more to that story, right? It was, it was not intentioned by you to come off that way. It was, uh, th there's more to it, right? Yeah, I, yeah, that, that's exactly right. I mean, when they invited me, it was, how it had been going where they they ask you to join the program they say it's going to be 6 p.m hit time can you join and they tell you at four o'clock and they give you some questions they say we're going to ask about this and this and this mm -hmm. and in my humble experience for this period of time 99 percent of the time they don't ask you about those things they ask about other things and so oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I initially was like doing my due diligence and i was like really trying to understand like okay they ask me this question let me go fact check it and make sure that there are multiple sources that are credible that back this up and then they would go live and asked me something completely different. And I was like, yeah. oh, I'm just now answering off the cuff, right? Right. And so what you get on, on, on my side, what I saw was a black screen. So I didn't even see, you know, when I was going live or what the feed looked like or anything. And so I, sure. I imagine, you know, as one might, like, oh, it's almost like a podcast. Like I'm just yeah. answering, but they're not seeing me, right? Right, right. Um, 
because I see a black screen. So yeah, obviously yeah. the viewer probably sees a black screen. It's like a very two-year-old yeah. way of thinking, I guess. Sure. And so I, I was shaking my head because it did not make sense. What she was saying did not make sense to me. And so, and then probably I was shaking it really hard because it really didn't make sense. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then when I got a chance to speak, you know, if you don't let me speak, my, my personality is that I, I'm like, you know, a kettle that just has a lot of steam and I get, like let it all out. Right. And so then I, I said what I said, which is essentially that I thought we were doing a pretty lousy job yeah. um, at that time. And I think, you know, in retrospect, we did a pretty lousy job throughout all of last year. But at that time in particular, it was pretty, it was pretty terrible. And, yes. and, and then to say the opposite was very disingenuous. And, and frankly, it was a lie. And so I, I said that not in those words, but, <laughs> but then, th yeah, there was an awkward silence and then it did go viral. And I'm not, I, I didn't have a Twitter account. And so then my wife was like, you need to be on Twitter right now. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, okay. I'll deal with it in the morning. Like, what's the big deal? Yeah. And she's like, no, I'm making an account for you right now. And so right. she went and found, I'm not even sure exactly what she did, but she found a picture of me and put it on. And then I gained a lot of followers that night and into the next day because of that, because of that, yeah. um, that uh, video clip going viral. Yeah, I've seen that picture. It's you dunking on uh, <laughs> a logo of Fox News, and the caption's just like, in your face, in your face. <laughs> um, you know, as doctors, I think, we, generally speaking, we, we strive for objectivity, you know, truth based on evidence, um, you know, free of subjective opinion. It's no secret that virtually every aspect of the pandemic, uh, or certainly the response to it, has been um, controversial with people on both sides with opinions and information, whether things are true or not. Did you feel pressure in any of these interviews to say a certain thing where, where you led down a certain path to uh, maybe, you know, um, further somebody's agenda that or, or point they're trying to make and they're using you as a way to back them up? Yeah, for sure. And where and, and where that happened probably um, in a funny way, not not in all the interviews, but in some of them was with uh, some interviews I did with CCTV. So this is uh, China's national television program. Oh yeah, and it goes out to obviously, as one might imagine, a massive audience uh, sure. in in the billions probably. And so um, some of the questions, and, and I don't blame them honestly. They were, they, you know, I, it was funny at the time. It's funny to me now. <laughs> but they would ask me questions like Anthony. It was it was literally like this. It was like, I'll I'll pretend I'm the interviewer. Anthony, do you find it difficult to have a president who? either doesn't understand science or or understands it and then goes out of his way to oppose it as much as he can. And you're like, whoa. <laughs> I I get that you have an, an anti-Trump agenda. Yeah. And the president they were referring to is Donald Trump because yeah. that was when this happened. And sure. and and it's like they literally needed me to say their talking point because again, like I'm an American doctor, so you can say yeah. I'm American. I can almost read the headline. Uh, American doctor says X, Y, Z, and you're like, exactly. I think I just said what you told me to say back to you. And so <laughs> there were there were a lot of like moments like that where it was it was it was comical. It was like, okay, I get it. You wanna you wanna take a victory lap around the president. The the <clears throat> truth is that you know if we all don't get our act together and focus on the solution, right. you know, if we keep like looking backwards and be like, that's to blame and that's to blame. Like, do you think that this is over? It's right. not over. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. um, that was that was pretty common. But yeah, I think that addresses your question. Like that would yeah. come up quite a bit, yeah. Yeah, I'm, you know, the one person or entity that doesn't care about this is COVID. They're just like, Mr. Burns, excellent. They're Dude, like, please yeah. congregate and fight amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah, no, exactly. It felt very much like Game of Thrones, where yeah, it's like, right. I should be in charge. No, seriously, you should be in charge. Yeah, You're like, yeah. you know the White Walkers are coming. Yeah, they, yeah. they don't care about our little infighting right yeah, now. Yeah. All please gather indoors. And yeah, exactly. Um, so, okay, this is the Sports Medicine North Pod. Let's talk a little sports medicine. So cool. organized sports obviously were shut down largely during the pandemic for this last year and a half or so. Pro sports did go on, but obviously with alterations, NBA bubble, March Madness had a bubble, Major League Baseball had the uh, bubble for their playoffs. And now this season, sports have come back slowly to some sort of, some sort of sense of normalcy. 
uh, fans are returning to stadiums. Oracle Park, where the Giants played, they just opened up to full capacity for this uh, most recent Bay Bridge series. W what do you think? Is it too soon? About right? Um, uh, could it happen sooner? Where do you think we're at in terms of coming back to a normal sort of sense of not only participating in, but also spectating sports? It's a good question. I guess I, in my mind, I think of black, I think of white, and I think of gray. And if it's within the gray, I usually don't argue against it. Yeah. And so to me, you know, it wasn't like absolutely the right thing to do or absolutely the wrong thing to do. Sure. I think it's within the normal band yeah. of gray. And so I do think that it happened on the timeline that makes sense. I think that the way that they did it was, to be honest with you, I don't know if you read the NBA protocol by chance. Um, I think it was like, I want to say it's on the order of 50 plus pages. I think it's ridiculously and long. From what it was really, really detailed. Yeah. Yeah. And it was incredibly well put together. It was like mm -hmm. one of the best documents I've looked at. I was like, wow, this is a really thoughtfully put together like manifesto on what we should do. And by comparison, I actually looked at like documents put forth at the time by the CDC uh -huh. and by public health departments here in California. And they were so vague by comparison. Yeah. Like, whoa, like, <laughs> how is it that the NBA, and I guess it comes down to like NBA has money and they basically use it on paying public health officials to write out really detailed plans yeah. that are going to work, right? Yeah. Um, but it was really good. I was like, wow, this is actually a really thoughtful document. I wish we had something similar to this yeah. for the country, <laughs> you know, because it's so well articulated. And, and so, yeah, I guess ultimately – I think that what they did was safe. It was in the bounds of like what was reasonable. Um, I think the big challenge right now is that like, I think people have a mentality of like, oh, it's past tense. We're done, right? We're good. Yeah. And here's the thing, you know, there's always three factors. There's like how much something is going to spread, how contagious right. it is. There's how virulent it is, which is a different question, right? Because you could spread a lot, but maybe it's not as virulent. Yeah. Or it could be really virulent, but just not spread very much. Yeah. Um, so two separate questions. And then third is how effective our vaccine is against that thing, right? right. It could be that it you know, spreads a lot, is super virulent, but our vaccines are great. Right. Uh, or it could be the opposite, where our vaccines don't cover it at all. Yeah. Those three variables are ones that we should always be thinking about. And there, there's Delta, there's the Delta variant, not the Delta sure. airlines. Yeah. Um, there's, well, there's that too. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's Delta Plus. Yeah. And the fact is that there's going to be like Delta triple plus, Delta triple plus with an exclamation mark. Like this is going to keep coming out with variants, right? right? And so what if you had a variant that comes out, let's say three months from now or four months from now, that it's more contagious, so similar to Delta, which is super contagious, yeah. but it's also more virulent. Yeah. And the immune, you know, the, uh, the vaccine doesn't provide the same level of immunity. Like what if those other two are, are also right. checked off, right? Yeah. All of a sudden, we're like, whoa, we need to go back on lockdown. We need to shut things back. To, you know what I mean? Like, that's what would happen. So I just want people to realize that, like, this is a fight, right? Yeah. And we're not done with the fight. It's like, sure. yeah, we might have, like, hit the virus with a great, you know, right hand, but it's not gone. <laughs> and if you don't watch your face, you're going to get hit right back. And so that's where we're at. And I do worry that I think a lot of folks are like, all right, well, we suffered a year and a half. Yeah. We're done now. Let's just have a normal NBA finals and call it a day. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I, I like that too. I'm a huge fan of basketball specifically. I've mentioned it like three times already on this podcast. Yeah. And so I love that. But I also want people to not forget that like we might have to do other things like, yeah. and, you know, go back to a protective state or whatever if, sure. if other variants pop up. Now, do I think that's likely? Well, less and less likely every day as the, right. as the world starts to get a control of this thing. Um, but it's still in the realm of possibility. Yeah, and that leads into my next question, which is over the past one, two, maybe three months, some of the messaging, specifically, let's say about masking, has been a bit mixed. So I don't know if it's maybe six to eight weeks ago, CDC said vaccinated people can go unmasked outdoors. And then maybe, I don't know, three weeks ago or so, vaccinated people can go on mask indoors, which seems like a huge incentive to get vaccinated, right? And now the World Health Organization, and maybe it's because of this Delta variant, which I want to get your take on, uh, it's spreading like hotcakes in other parts of the world. And the World Health Organization saying, you know, 
vaccinated people will probably keep the masks on even when you're you know when when you're indoors. And when we look at sports, it's that same way. So during the playoffs, head coaches are allowed to go maskless on the sideline, but their assistant coaches and the players have to wear masks even though they're also on the sidelines but on the bench. Uh, I, I mentioned Oracle Park. So their current policy is basically recommending masking for unvaccinated people, particularly if they're going to go indoors to get a beer or something. Oakland Coliseum, just across the bay, they're following the California Department of Public Health recommendations, which are basically following the CDC, which is masking for unvaccinated people, particularly indoors, is mandatory. And so you see all of these kind of contradictory things. It's hard to see, to figure out what is the right messaging, what is the right decision and maybe this just falls all into that gray area that you're mentioning but it's confusing no totally confusing and so maybe we can take that one at a time you know the first one the who is in charge of all of the countries around the world and many yeah. of the countries have a zero vaccination rate right now because yeah. they don't have vaccines so if you're in a population where you've got zero people protected you have to give guidance that's going to be much more aggressive and stringent and then on the other end, you've got America, which now, you know, leads the pack or is in, in, the, in the leading pack of, of having folks immunized, right? Yeah. And so we're really seeing a very different world from like what they're seeing in, let's say, Nepal or India. Sure. And so as a WHO, if you're the parent organization, you've got to give guidance to all the countries. You're going to say, okay, overall, we think it probably makes sense to mask and, and you're going to do that because that's where the world's at. Yeah. Um, America right now, with the CDC offers these guidelines, but this is the awkward thing, right? Like when you have a democracy and you have, you know, it's not a law, it's a guideline. Yeah. And, and then as a country, a lot of us, you know, have the mentality of like, well, I know best, or, you know, our company knows best, or our organization knows best, and we'll, we'll take that into consideration. Sure. And you're like, okay, well then the MLB is gonna do this, the NFL is gonna do that, the NBA is right. gonna do this. And so when people see that, they're like, oh, it's like, why are they doing this when that, that other group's doing that? And so it becomes super confusing between corporations and companies. And, and then finally, you've got the last level of confusion, which is like you said, assistant coaches can do this, but then head coaches can do that. Right. And you're like, that makes almost no sense. You know, yeah. like, like maybe they've internally decided that because of the fact that like the head coach you know, needs to voice their opinion yeah. more. Like, I don't know why they don't do that. Um, but it, it doesn't make logical sense. And right. so I think that's that's one where I would say that that's much more black and white. Yeah. Whereas the other ones are a little bit more gray. Whereas, you know, so if I was coming in to the, to the NBA, like I saw that, I was like, they're doing something that's so irresponsible because they're creating confusion for their own team. And so there's right. a safety issue there. But then they have an increased you know, um, responsibility because they're on national TV right. and everyone sees that. And so like it or not, they're, they're leaders, they're mentors. Yeah, absolutely. And if they can't actually get their act together and do something that's at least consistent yeah. then everyone sees that they're like, Oh, I'm throwing my hands up. All this is nonsense. Sure. And so, yeah, I was disappointed when I saw that. Yeah. L let's talk about vaccine apprehension. So we've heard a number of our elite athletes or pro athletes come out and say they're skeptical or decline to say whether they've been vaccinated or not, or just flat out say they're not going to get it. And, you know, this is not just NBA players or professional players. This applies to our, the entire United States, right? So the uh, data, latest data I saw today is about 46% of Americans are vaccinated. Uh, I, I was just at Disneyland, open, free for all, also going with the CDC guidelines. Um, but I'll tell you, you know, 54% of my fellow masketeers, they were not masking. And so the numbers don't add up, right? I'm, I'm thinking maybe five to 10% of people. Um, you know, I don't think that 90% of that population at Disneyland is vaccinated. So, you know, um, again, vaccines have become part of the uh, political process. They've been, it's a, it's a polarizing issue, but you know, what, what do you make of it when you see this hesitation to, to get the vaccine? Well, I mean, I think one of them, one, one of the factors is like, if I say something 10,000 times, I know that people will start to believe it's true, right? Like 1984 famously, you know, that book kind of talks about repetition creates truth. And so we've heard it repeated so many times, you know, the idea that like masks are not necessary, masks are overkill, maybe your carbon dioxide level inside your mask builds up and maybe that's toxic. 
all sorts of things have been said. And so when you say it over and over and over again, that's what the political machine has done. Yeah. Um, then of course you're going to create a lot of doubt. So I would say that it helps to reaffirm the fact that repetition works, right? right. Um, and and that if it works, then you could do it on the other side. Like you could also create repetition machines that say like masks are healthy, masks prevent viruses from spreading, mm-hmm. masks are safe. You could create that sort of a propaganda machine as well, and then convince the same minds that were convinced one way to swing the other way. Right. Um, so that's one thing you could do. I think that that's the reason for it. And then tied to that is kind of a deeper underpinning of like, I guess, both a math, but also a science illiteracy in this country. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of people just don't understand. And it's not it's not to to fault any individual, but I think it's, it's really a, a fault of our educational system. Like we have really let down ourselves because we have for years now seen that, you know, in terms of math and science, our, you know, our, our students are not turning out the way that they should yeah and and then if you just let that foster and say okay no big deal well then 10 years later when you're trying to explain a math or a science concept to them and they're adults now and they don't get it yeah. don't be so surprised yeah because they didn't get it when they were graduating high school and that's the last time they had a touch point with them sure and so i think that's the two those are the two kind of driving forces you've got this kind of you know precondition around the country where already people didn't understand the truth and then it got, and then where there's a vacuum, it got replaced by this kind of noise machine um, of mistruth, uh, which you know is is why this is happening. Sure. Uh, you mentioned Delta before. That's making a lot of headlines right now. Is this a concern for us here in the United States? Yeah, <laughs> because, and the reason is because the Delta variant. Uh, you know, going back to those three questions, right? Is it more contagious? Is it more virulent? and do our vaccines protect against it. Right. Um, we're super lucky right now because it is not thought to be that much more virulent. Mm. It is not thought to have escaped our vaccines, mm. right? So, so that's great. So yeah. two out of three is good, but unfortunately it is much more contagious. Yeah. And so because it's much more contagious, it's rapidly gonna outpace the wild type and it's gonna spread quickly. Yeah. Um, and as such, if you haven't had the vaccine and you haven't had COVID yet, you're going to get COVID, right? Sure, sure. Very, very good chance you're going to get COVID, especially because of what you said, you know, in terms of like people going to Disneyland and they're going to spread it. And so I think that that's the challenge that if you're unvaccinated, you're, you're in for a ride. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think we're seeing now some unexpected fallout from COVID. Obviously there's the medical conditions and we don't know, I think some of these lingering effects that the COVID positive patients have had, will take some time to really play out, but uh, sort of more societally, you know, there's other issues that maybe were unintended. Some of the psychological fallout, you know, the NBA players, a few of them have courageously come out to say that their time in the NBA bubble, that isolation was very challenging to their mental health. Um, You know, we've seen aggressive behavior in grocery stores that you wouldn't normally, uh, you know, uh, observe. Um, People behaving badly at airports, fan behavior at some of the NBA games seems to have gotten better, but when the playoffs first started, people just acting a fool. You know, not normal behavior. Are, are any of these repercussions things you've considered, you know, at least as time has gone on and the pandemic's played out? Yeah, totally. I think that those are really good points. And, you know, this is also on a backdrop of a lot of anti-Asian violence and a lot of anti-Black violence and, yeah. you know, protests in, in response to that. And so the backdrop is I think we have a country that's already kind of amped up um because of the social unrest and issues that are you know coming to a fore yeah and then like you said you know we're 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 now a year and a half into this and it's unclear if this is near the end or if this is going to go on for another year and a half you know who knows right yeah um and so with all that said i think the isolation has been really devastating and i think the group that has been hardest hit the two groups probably one would be you know teenagers between the age of 13 and 19. You know, that's like such a formative time. And for that group, you know, we talked about it at the beginning, you know, when, when I was talking about my own upbringing and, and what that was like. But like, honestly, if you're not around your peer group at that time, that's really, really harmful. I think it's very, very harmful. And the American Academy of Pediatrics has spoken about this. But basically, it creates a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, a lot of, you know, uh, depression yeah. and suicidality. 
And so those are like, that's one big group that's been really affected that, that age group. And then tied to that is parents, parents of those kids, right? Yeah, sure. That have to like deal with these issues with their children. And then also have to do this other thing called the J-O-B, right? Yeah. They got to go to work <laughs> and like do their day job. And you right. know, that's really hard, right? Mm -hmm. um, much, much harder than it otherwise would be. And so I think that those two groups, you know, have been so, so hurt by this and, and damaged by this. And I think we're going to see the consequences, like you said, you know, play out for many, many years ahead. Um, you know, for example, like in history books, we talk about the potato famine and then how generations were affected by that too. Yeah. Right? And yeah. I think a similar thing here, like if you're, if your parent was 16 during COVID-19, right. Yeah. And that parent grows up and has, you know, ongoing issues around depression and anxiety, and now has kids that that kid is going to suffer from their parent sure, having had sure. those issues and so it creates a cycle and i think that that's one of the biggest challenges you know and then not to like belabor this but then of course we haven't even talked about unemployment and yeah. so another big reason for depression anxiety and other mental health stresses is when you don't have a job and one of the things that i think came up in this last year you know obviously we had, a, we had a, an election um was this concept of universal basic income and it was so interesting because like in the early days of the election, it was kind of this abstract idea that, you know, primarily Andrew Yang, you know, put on the scene. Yeah. And then and then a year into it, we're talking about COVID and like now every like both Republicans and Democrats are, yep, yep, let's mail the checks out, you know. Sure. And you're like, wow, like <laughs> this is like a theoretical thing like a year ago. And now it's like you're on your third check, you know, already. So yeah. yeah. Um, it's really interesting how fast politics can move when it needs to uh -huh. on issues like that, right? Like or you know, take another example, like Medicare for all, like a very flashpoint discussion. Sure. And then like a year later, we find out that like, oh, all COVID diagnostics, that's all free. Uh, yeah. If you're hospitalized for COVID, yeah, that's all free. Sure. You're like, oh, vaccine, yeah, it's all, free. like it's all covered. You're like, yeah. oh, wait, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> how, how is it like this thing that we debated a year ago? No, it's all free. <laughs> so I think very quickly, these like two things have changed. And the reason I mentioned the unemployment piece is that I think that that also is a big factor in why people are feeling this social isolation kind of distance is that yeah. they don't have the normal bonds that strengthen our society. And even people at work, you know, now, but telework, it's a very different thing to telework and have Zoom back to back to back to back, yeah. where all you're doing is working, frankly. Yeah. But what it used to be is you'd have like maybe half as many meetings, but then you like go and chit chat with your coworker because you like yeah. it. Yeah. or you'd talk about nonsense over lunch. And so there's like, even even work, you know, kind of felt social, right? And now work doesn't feel social, it feels like yeah. work. Yeah. And so I think that's another kind of piece of this, where another area where the social glue is kind of dissolved, you know? Yeah, I think in the sports world, we have this interesting dichotomy because one of the hotbed issues in the NBA, which has just been ravaged by untimely injuries, and some may be related to the lack of rest that teams who played in the bubble last year did not get, uh, or lack of rest they had in between the end of the bubble and the start of this shortened NBA season, which was 10 games shorter than normal, but still pretty lengthy season. And LeBron James has now famously come out and on Twitter and said that it certainly is a rest, and LeBron James is probably one of the smartest basketball players minds in the world if not the smartest and so certainly whenever he speaks on something like that it, it uh, deserves attention um but on the and there may be something to that but on the flip side you know those athletes who don't get paid uh to play money on tv uh to, to play their sport on tv are youth athletes what's going to be the fallout from them missing a year of sports you know was the 17 year old basketball player who was set to have a scholarship what does it mean that he hasn't played a game in a year and these are things that we are trying to anticipate, but we ultimately won't really know until we kind of see how things play out and we get a little bit more perspective. Yeah, and I think youth sports is interesting because it's probably one of the other areas where that's a big part of the social glue. Absolutely. Right? Like, and you don't have youth sports, that 17 year old's like feeling really angsty for a year, right? right like, right. like that's the other thing. So like, I think a lot of people are like, oh, like, it almost feels like youth sports in many people's minds get gets equated to like a frivolous activity yeah. that kind of doesn't matter. But I think when you reframe it, it's like, no, this is a group that is about to become an adult. They are at high risk oftentimes for like 
you know, basically doing doing other activities that are not super productive or useful for society. And sports is like one of the best things they could be doing. And then we canceled it. Yeah. And so then really try to calculate all of the, the societal cost to that. It's massive. Yeah. And so I think that's one of the areas where it was challenging to say, like, hey, do you want to do you want to prevent kids from getting together because of this concern about COVID? And and how do we balance that out? You know, and I think when you say schools, people are like, oh, they're going to get educated. So, yeah, that's a priority. Yeah. But if you said after school sports, like, oh, that's not a priority because it's after school. It's not scholastic. Right. And I could imagine an argument kind of flipping the two and saying, well, actually, they might get better long term benefit from the sports because that's where they're engaged. Sure. And maybe less benefit from the school where they're actually not even engaged, you know, because of the, the way it's being taught or, you know, whatever. So I, I can easily see that. And so I, I do think that there's a lot to be said for youth sports because of the important role it plays in that group. Yeah, you know, there's obviously is a concern. Is there going to be an increased risk of physical injury because somebody's had a year off and they're yeah. ready to go and they're just going to go nuts when they get back on the field? But also, what you touched on that psychological distress because a lot of our athletes, and I was certainly this way in high school, being an athlete is who you are. It is a huge part of your psyche, and to be denied that uh, by no fault of your own is, is going to be challenging for a lot of our athletes and. Um, you know, we'll see how it plays out and, uh, th there's going to be people who suffer and it's, it's nobody's fault. I think that's one thing to point out. This is not a democratic or Republican party. This is a, this is a problem. This is a COVID problem. And you had to make decisions that we th think were in the best interest of everybody's safety, but, uh, it sucked, right? This is just, you know, nobody wants to be in a pandemic and, and, and we were, and, uh, we'll, we'll see what the ramifications of that are. Yeah, I think that's totally, totally accurate. And you know, there are so many examples of both, you know, just going back to politics, both Republicans and Democrats stepping up and doing a good job right. during this pandemic as well. Yeah. So, yeah, I totally agree on that point. Um, I want to spend some time talking about osmosis and what you do there, uh, particularly your interest in, in education and, and online education. So you actually were with another company before osmosis that was also in this uh, sort of virtual education space. That was Khan Academy, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. A lot of parents might recognize it because it's a, it's a math education platform. I was mm -hmm. there for about four years um, making like health education videos. Right, right. And Osmosis is more tailored towards creating educational content for the, the medical world, correct? Yeah, so it's, it's really aimed at nursing students, medical students that are maybe going through school, struggling, um, and then they go to like, where does everyone go? You go to Google or YouTube. You type in the thing that you're struggling with, mm -hmm. and then a video pops up, and oftentimes it, it may be one of ours. So we'll put our videos on YouTube, and that's sometimes the first taste of, of osmosis that people get. And then if you, if you watch it, if you like it, then people go and check out the website, which um, is oftentimes how people learn about all the other things that we do. But essentially what we're known for is kind of creating these little whiteboard animation videos yeah. that explain something that you otherwise might not understand. And sometimes it happens with like, you know, the lay audience, like, you know, we have this concern about um, a knee injury with Giannis the, the other night, right? Oh, yeah. Um, so they're like, oh, I heard he had an ACL. Like, What's an ACL? So check out, you know, ACL, and then a video might pop up around, like, what is that ligament? What does it do? And, sure. and so on and so forth. Well, as your, your role as chief medical officer, are you coming up with content ideas? Are you uh, supervising the content creation? What, what's your role? Yeah, so back in the day, I would help to write scripts and edit them. We had an, an illustrator, a medical illustrator, you know, yeah. draw the anatomy really, really well, so you can actually see things uh, as they're supposed to look. Um, and it was it was really a pretty simple process. Now the team has grown. We have a lot of illustrators. They do amazing work. A lot of like great anatomy work. You know, that's mm -hmm. the, I guess the 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 striking thing. Uh, and so a lot of bones and ligaments and joints, things like that. Um, but yeah, ultimately, my job is to make sure the content is accurate, up to date. Um, and then if there are gaps, you know, if, if, you know, Anthony, you pointed out a gap for me the other day, uh, if there are gaps to say like, hey, can we prioritize this over that, you know? That yeah. kind of thing. Sure. Um, you know, at the medical school level, online education has been around for a long time. It certainly was when I was in medical school and I never went to class because it was taped and shown online later. And I'd rather sleep in and hang out with my dog and watch lecture there. Uh, with my own bathroom right around the corner. Um, that's just me. But, um, 
you know, with the pandemic, online education has been pushed to the forefront. Zoom school is like a thing. Do you think this is the way of the future? It's a good question. I mean, I think that one of the things that a lot of people have right now is Zoom fatigue. You know, we talked about that a little bit before. And I was reading an article about like people are not going back to their jobs. They're essentially yeah. just going back home and not working for a while right, um, right. because people want time with each other, with the park, with the lake, with the beach, you know. And so I think that there is going to be and will always be uh, an online place for education. Um, certainly, I don't think it's going to be all of it. And what what we do in many ways, you're right, has been around. Some version of it has been around for a long, long time. And so the the thing that we do that's slightly different is instead of watching, like you said, you would watch it at home, right? The tape recorded lecture. Yeah. So let's say the lecture was an hour. I'm just imagining Anthony around the corner from his bathroom and his dog. Um, and you and maybe Anthony watches it on double speed, right? So he watches in 30 minutes and he's feeling good about himself. He's like, yeah, I got this. Um, what we what we try to do is essentially take that hour and make it into seven minutes. Uh -huh. Like what is the seven minute thing you need to learn, right? Yeah. We get all the redundancy out. We try to essentially make it into like a picture. So you're like, okay, I can remember pictures pretty easily yeah. and show you the thing, right? Whatever it is that you're learning. And then, and then you'll probably still know Anthony, he'll probably still two exits. So now it's down to three and a half minutes. And, and then that's it. Like, that's the big difference in terms of the video. Is that like, it's much more visually stimulating. Yeah. So if I ask you about an hour later and you watched a, a PowerPoint, it's hard to take text and remember what the text said. Right. Yeah. But if I showed you a picture of the thing, you're like, oh yeah, yeah. Basically it's like, just think of like a ball in a socket. And this kind of rotates, and what happens every once in a while is that, and, and you can explain it because you saw the picture, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's that. Those are the differences, like super visual and super short. Yeah, I like your attempts at this orthopedic education that you're going. Get the ball, <laughs> the ball moves. socket. I know that's, and that I'll I'll be honest. That's about the the max in terms of my understanding of how orthopedics works. I mean, that's that's how I was explained to it in medical school. My understanding is that it's all just balls and sockets and. That's about it, right, Anthony? That, that's how it works. That's basically it. Exactly. It's typically, something used to look like this, and then you it know, looks like this. And yeah. then it like this <laughs> right. Again. Totally. You know, it's funny. <laughs> that's I used the, to. That's the end. I, I That'll be twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> You're right. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I, my my main interaction with with orthopedics was always like spinal rod infections, and oh so gosh. when rods get yeah. infected, they call yes. IT, and so like that's the one thing that I I got to know really well. So yeah. I like, took the time to understand how that procedure worked, and I right. like, had a good understanding of it. Um, but yeah, just I have mad respect for what y'all do. It's pretty yeah, fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's always the fun conversation. The ID doc oh says, <laughs> yeah, right, you no, got to no. take the metal out. No, the doc take says, it out. absolutely no way. <laughs> no, it's not even. It's just the redness is right at the margins. I think it's a skin infection. I'm like, yeah, no, it's dehissed. <laughs> I don't think it's a skin infection. <laughs> like, uh, have we tried? Have we tried a little? Like, what do you guys use nowadays? Clinda? I'm like, no, we don't use Clinda nowadays. We, <laughs> we've stepped it up. Sprinkle but, um, a little, sprinkle that vancomycin powder on it. Sprinkle yeah, yeah right, exactly. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, always, always. <laughs> Reese, thanks so much for coming on. This has been awesome. Really great to catch up with you and uh, hear about the exciting things you've been up to in these. Crazy experiences. I mean, you got to hang out with uh, Dr. Ken. What was that like? He's the most humble dude. Like, he's yeah. a really, really nice, humble, humble guy. He's married to a, a physician as well. Right. Um, and I imagine that she keeps him humble. And he also is a kid who I think also, he was like, yeah, my, 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 my child does not think I'm funny at all. And so I'm always working to gain their, their you know, uh, validation and so he, he was great i i really really liked him a lot and he has such an incredible story i honestly in many ways a story that's not that different from your story though as well you know? except he did it the opposite way where he was a doctor and had some money in his pocket first and then he became an actor whereas i was an actor who had no money in his pocket and it was like I need to do something to eat, and so I'm going to become a doctor. <laughs> but now that but now that you've eaten, Anthony, now that you've had a meal, you might want to I go back down to the point. So. I'm just using this interview, Rishi, uh, to use you, much like Fox News did. 
to get to Ken Jeong. So yeah, 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 totally. uh, you know, and I'm I'm happy that uh, you're you're willing to you know let me step on your back for that. Absolutely, anytime, <laughs> anytime, brother. I actually uh, this might be too much information. I, I interviewed at. He's been very vocal that he worked at a Kaiser Permanente in Southern California. I yeah. interviewed there for a job, and the people there said uh, he was hilarious when he was their partner in practice, and so. Um, he, he was always destined for stardom. I think he used to do, they used to give him at a Christmas party 10 minutes or something just to do stand up, and he would just roast everybody. And they said it was hilarious, and he, he, he's always been a funny guy. So uh, um, he, he's, doing, he's doing something he's really good at. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And you can kind of tell, you can just tell he loves his job, and yes. he's just, yeah, a wonderful, wonderful person. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's finish up with five questions with Rishi Desai. Here we go. Number okay. one, Rish, if you were never a doctor, what would you be doing right now? And I heard you tell Ken Jeong you wanted to be a stand-up comedian. So if that's it, fine. But dream big here. What, what would you be? <laughs> I, I think if um, if I could, yeah, I think stand-up would be awesome. That's one thing for sure. I think another thing I would want to do is there are these math problems that like are deemed unsolvable. I would probably try to seriously like just lock myself in a room and like spend time with one of them like that's what, that's that's truly what i would want to do uh long term and i think maybe on nights and weekends go and do stand up like that would be some combination there would be amazing i'm picturing you uh, like john nash in a beautiful mind we're just you're writing on a window i think to be honest this would be the other version of that movie the boring version where like nothing is actually discovered it's just like two hours of like yeah. me getting confused by something that i wrote yesterday i'm like what was i thinking and and then the movie plays credits you're like what the hell was that movie that was terrible that's more like what it would be but yeah that, i think i'd still find joy in doing that yeah all right um you are a ucla graduate as we've talked about uh you need to justify to me your friend how you could allow yourself to attend USC for your fellowship. <laughs> so I'll, I'll say this. When I, was, when I was at USC, I, when I got there, I negotiated, before I even stepped foot at USC, I negotiated that I could get my MPH at UCLA. So that was part of the deal. I see. Was, was that I could go across town and spend time at UCLA. Yeah. And so even while at USC in enemy territory, I was still right. ruined at heart. You were still bleeding. I was. Gold. I All was. Right. All right. We just switched to Jordan brand. It's very exciting. Yeah. Um, okay. So one of the great things about medicine is it affords us the opportunity to travel the country, travel the world. I myself have been uh, all over Midwest, East Coast, West Coast. Uh, you've traveled around the country as well as abroad. What, what's been your favorite destination uh, along these travels? So this is, I, I rarely kind of pine for going back to a place, like yeah. will I you know, really want to go back to a place. One place I would love to go back to, if I could, would be Kyoto, Japan. Oh yeah. Oh my God, that city yeah. and that country, but that city particularly, I just yeah. really, really loved Kyoto. I, to be honest, like the whole time I was there, I was like, is this real? Like I felt like I was like pinching myself over and over. So yeah, I absolutely loved Kyoto and I would go back in a second. I, I yeah, can't say enough yeah, about it. Yeah, Kyoto's full of like older temples and, and uh, a lot of history. Yeah, and they have this like beautiful like river walk on the east side of the city. Mm -hmm. They have like these beautiful like forests that you can kind of meander through on the left, sure. like in the west. It was just, it was fantastic. I loved it. Yeah, and not too far from there, I think, is Nara, which is this little town where just deer are like walking through the city. It's just like their thing, and they're like deer are like squirrels in this place, and they just you know roam the streets. It's uh, it, it's wild. Yeah, uh, yeah, awesome. Japan is great. Um, okay, you've lived now in the Bay Area for many years. You are from Southern California originally, if I'm not mistaken. You grew up a Los Angeles Lakers fan, but you've been in the Bay Area during the Dynasty Dubs era. Have you jumped ship? Ditch the Lakers. Are you a Steph Curry fanatic? Are you a Golden State Warrior fan now? I, I am. I'm a huge, huge, huge Golden State Warriors fan. But but I'm also a Fairweather fan. So uh, I am <laughs> right now. So right I'm now a they're dead huge, to you. <laughs> exactly. So I'm a huge, huge Suns fan right now, and I'm so excited to see what happens in the in the finals. Um, but yeah, so I, I was so, so stoked, uh, to see and to be here, uh, when they were going through their dynasty. That was yeah. exciting. Yeah. 
It may not be over. Everybody tells me it's over, but <laughs> we'll see what trades uh, happen. <laughs> who's your favorite Laker of all time? My favorite Laker? Yeah. Oh, for sure, Kobe Bryant. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I I grew up watching Magic Johnson and Kareem and Worthy. And so I love that crew. But then when I just got really hardcore into the Lakers, uh, was when it was, you know, the you know, the 2000, 2001 era yeah. of, of Shaq and Kobe. And sure. um, so, yeah, I'm a huge yeah. Kobe fan. Hard, hard not to root for. Yeah. Uh, okay. Question number five, politics aside, what is it to, what is your pitch to those who are wary of the COVID-19 vaccine? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So I would say that um, anything you've heard that COVID-19 vaccine can do, like you've heard blood clots, you've heard it can cause, you know, that's probably the main one, but like it can cause you to have some pain, soreness, fever, whatever. Anything you've heard it can do, multiply it by a thousand, and that's what COVID nineteen disease can do to you. And so, if any of those things are worrisome to you, or your you know your family, go like, oh, I don't want a blood clot, or I don't want this, or I don't want that. That's valid, but now that should only just encourage you to get the vaccine because it's a thousandth of what the disease does. Um, and also, on a very personal note, my grandfather died of COVID-19. Hmm. I have other loved ones that have died of COVID-19. So it's not this theoretical thing that could happen. Um, I've had younger folks that have gotten real sick in the ICU with COVID-19 yeah. uh, in my family. So it's not it's not this like numbers thing. Like it, it really hits home. And when it's your family, you immediately see the, the point of the vaccine. Sure. Rish, again, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, we got the Osmosis website up as well as our website. And you guys have a YouTube channel as well, which puts out uh, awesome content, as you said. So please check them out. Check out our YouTube channel. Please subscribe, like, share, continue to listen. Risha, keep doing what you're doing. And uh, can't wait to see you next time in person. We'll grab a beer and, and catch up again. Thanks, man. That was awesome. All right. Take care. Bye. Hey, folks. Thanks for tuning in. If you like the show, please subscribe, like, and share. And we love to hear from you. If you have a question about today's show or you, a loved one, or maybe your favorite athlete has sustained a sports medicine injury that you would like to know more about, please reach out to us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or email. And stay tuned for more exciting content from the Sports Medicine Orthopod. Thanks again.